So we're looking back at this large model of the heart. This time we're going to look at some of the internal structures. So if we remove part of the wall there of the right atrium, we can see inside now. So here we've got the internal aspect of the chamber. And what we can see is that on the internal wall here, there are all these ridges. You can see these ridges here. They're called pectinate muscles. So the pectinate muscles are on the internal surface of the atrium wall. Now, another thing we can see here on the internal surface is this little red dot in here, which is the opening of the coronary sinus. Now, the coronary sinus is this vein here running along the posterior aspect of the heart. And you can see that all the veins of the heart drain into the coronary sinus. So this is blood that has uh, gone to the, the heart muscle, given off oxygen, and is now deoxygenated and is heading back towards the heart. So this coronary sinus actually goes into th the wall of the right atrium and empties, it sends the deoxygenated blood into the right atrium along with the blood from the superior and inferior vena cava. So this here, this dot in here is the opening, but the coronary sinus is actually this vessel here on the posterior aspect of the heart. Now just superior and a bit posterior to the opening of the coronary sinus here, we have this little fossa, and this is the oval fossa. Now the oval fossa is a depression in the wall of the atrium that actually has a matching one in the left atrium. So here it is here. And so if we were to punch a hole through here, we'd turn up in the right atrium. And likewise, if we did the same thing here, we'd end up in the left atrium. So this is a fossa that's in the wall between the two atria. Now when you're a fetus, it was a foramen. It was an opening between the two atria so that blood could easily go from the right side of your heart to the left. Now, when, once you start breathing, you don't want that to happen anymore, and the foramen hopefully closes over, and what you're left with is just a depression. So that's the oval fossa there. Now then, if we remove the uh, anterior wall of the, the two ventricles, now we can see inside the ventricles, which is really cool, what we can see is we've got two chambers here, separated by a wall, which is the interventricular septum. And we can see that in each of the ventricles, there's a couple of valves. Now, this valve here, this white one here, has, is a little bit damaged, but it has three cusps. One, two, three. So three cusps, they're like leaves. So there's three cusps there. So this is the tri cuspid valve, or right atrioventricular valve. Okay, it's on the right-hand side of the heart. It's between the right atrium and the right ventricle. So, so either of those names is correct. And we can see that it's attached, or attaching to the cusps of the valves, we have these little cords, which are called tenderness cords. And again, a couple of those a little bit damaged on this model. Sorry about that. But they're tenderness cords, and they're commonly known as your heartstrings. Let's just zoom in, have a slightly closer look at them and what they're attached to. So here we can see a cusp of the tricuspid valve with these tenderness cords attached. Notice that they're also attached to this muscle. This is a papillary muscle. And we can see there's one here and another one here that they're attached to the tendinous cords, which then attach to the cusps of the tricuspid valve. Now, the same thing happens in the left ventricle, where we have a couple of papillary muscles here. Here we have tendinous cords, a bit harder to see on this side, but there are tendinous cords there, but this time there's only two cusps to this valve. So this is the bicuspid, or mitral valve, or left atrioventricular valve. So that's on the left-hand side there. Now, while we're here looking at the ventricle wall, though, we can also see that in the walls of the ventricles, you have these little ridges, just like we had in the atria, but here they're called trabeculae carniae. So these are the trabeculae carniae, 
in the atrium they are called uh, in the atrium we we're looking at they were called pectinate muscles okay so that's some of the structures of the ventricles if we then look to zoom out a bit to get a clearer idea of what we're looking at if we look at the superior aspect of the ventricles we can see there's a valve in each one so this valve here is leading to the pulmonary trunk so in the and that's in the right atrium we're seeing this valve so that's the pulmonary valve there so the pulmonary valve will be pushed open when the right ventricle squeezes and deoxygenated blood will be pushed up into the pulmonary trunk it will go from there through the pulmonary arteries to the lungs come back through the pulmonary veins into the left atrium from the left atrium it falls down into the left ventricle and then what's left is squeezed down when the atria contract and then push it comes down through the open bicuspid valve here and then hopefully the left ventricle starts squeezing from the bottom squeezes the blood up what should happen see how the cusps of the mitral valve they're actually facing down into the ventricle like so and so when the ventricle squeezes those cusps should shut like like so and what should happen instead of blowing open and allowing blood back into the uh, atria what should happen is these cusps should stay shut because the tendinous cords are holding on to them and the papillary muscles are contracting which hold the tendinous cords nice and tightly which means hopefully this valve stays shut when it should and this valve the aortic valve is forced open by the pressure of the blood hitting it and that blood is then forced into the aorta and off around the body now, I think that's it.